Hello, this is Chris, ZL1CVD. Today I'd like to talk about the Yaesu FTDX10 and other Yaesu models including the DX101, the FT710, the FT991A and the uh, under the cover there is a hiding there is an FT891. These models uh, all suffer from a common fault which is losing the serial COM port. Um, you'll be using WSJTX and it will come up that it can't communicate. And there seems to be no rhyme or reason. Well, I think I've uh, figured out what causes it. And, let's, and what I hope to do in this video is show you that. First of all, let's confirm the fault. Uh, my computer runs Linux, uh, but there is a program called USB View or USB Viewer. Look it up online and it gives you a tree view, tree view of the connected devices, USB devices to your computer. Uh, the program's available, I see, for Mac and Windows, but as I say today, I'm using Linux. In the Linux version, I have to hit manually refresh it, so I've just refreshed it. We can see here, uh, these are the different um, USB uh, ports on my computer, and we can see on this one, we have got uh, already in the computer is a, another hub, and another hub, and another hub, and connected to that hard hub is my mouse. Okay, so let's plug in a working Yaesu transceiver. So this USB cable here connects to the FT991 A there, and we'll plug that into our computer. And we'll go back to our USB view, and we will hit refresh. We can see that the, the dual serial port CP2105, the dual USB UART, has come up. And underneath it is the USB audio codec. Now, all Yaesu models that support USB that I've mentioned will have the CP2105. And of important note is the vendor ID, which is 10C4, and the product ID, which is EA70. Those are both the default IDs when you use this chip the CP2105. Now, I wanted to understand why um, my FTDX10 has lost the ability to communicate to the CP2105. So, by plugging in the FT991A, we can see how it should look. Now, what we will do is we will now unplug the FT991A and we will plug in the FTDX10, which has got the fault. Now, we'll go back over here, and we will hit refresh. Now we can see that on that same port, we, have, we are only showing a USB audio codec. There is no CP2105. Now, interesting to note, on all, the way, on all these Yaesu uh, transceivers, you don't actually have to apply power to the transceiver to do this test. Um, the USB devices in the transceiver are powered by the USB port. So as soon as you plug that in, the 5 volts from the USB will power it up. So let's have a look at the circuit diagram in the transceiver. We, this is it here. We can see this is the USB socket here, and the... USB goes into a this chip here, which is a USB hub. It's a two-port hub. From there, the data comes in through here and goes into the CP2105. Uh, there's also, the data also goes across to the audio codec, which is a standard PCM2903. Okay, so that's how it's configured inside the computer. Now, the 5 volts, if you trace it from here, you can see that it's powering this chip, and then this chip is powering the rest of it. So, I have traced that all through, but that's not the point of my video today. My point of the video today is the CP2105 over here. This little culprit is going faulty. Now, we need to understand why. So, let's have a look at the CP2105 data sheet. We can see here, it's a Silicon Labs uh, single chip to dual USB bridge. One of the features is that of this chip is that it has 
a um, if we go down here we can see that it has uh, I'm looking for it we can see that it has an integrated 296 byte one-time programmable ROM for storing customization product information upon reading further reading the data sheet we see that that is achieved um, and we can see this is the block diagram and we can see the the PROM here or programmable read-only memory it's not EEPROM it can only be programmed once and once it's programmed that's it and what it does is it enables the manufacturer to program in their own custom VID PID now on reading the data sheet, data sheet we can see that the um, the VID PID, and I'm not sure what page that's on, it'll probably take me ages to find it again because everything's buried in these data sheets, but we can see that um, uh, that those numbers that I gave you before for VID PID are the standard ones that the chip comes from the factory with. The point I would like to, to draw your attention to here is pin 16 on the chip, these are the pin um, IDs, uh, numbers, the IDs and what the name is and a description over here. Now pin 16 is a special pin on the chip. If you hang a 4.7 microfarad capacitor on that pin it enables you to use the uh, Silicon Labs application software to program in a custom VID PID. So let's have a look again at the Yaesu circuit. And here we have uh, the CP2105 and here we have pin 16 and hanging off pin 16 sure enough is a 4.7 microfarad capacitor. Now when Yaesu typic, in, in Yaesu circuit diagrams if you've ever read them um, before you'll note that, that some components have got the star 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 underneath it and if we look over uh, if we look over here there's another one with a star 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 when they do that those parts are shown on the diagram but actually not populated on the board when they are populated on the board they generally have the component value underneath it we see that with this capacitor here the 4.7 microfarad so what I think is happening is the when when you're transmitting on the transceiver if there's a high RF field it's it's going to be this chip here is a is an ESD protection chip from Texas Instruments now this ESD protect, protection chip its main job is to clamp any excess voltages on the data lines um, to ground to prevent static discharge damaging the, the USB hub. So I believe what's happening is RF is getting in, it is being clamped down, this chip's doing its job, but enough of the RF is getting through the hub to this chip here, the CP2105, to put it into program mode and because it's not getting the correct data it's programming that ROM once to an invalid VID PID and that is I believe the reason why we are losing the COM port on these transceivers. Uh, one thing I do I note is there's not a lot of RFI suppression on here, I mean this will handle ESD but we don't see any uh, like ferrite beads or anything on the on the USB port, which I I probably wouldn't expect too much because um, USB 2 ports travel at quite a high speed, and if you get the wrong value ferrite beads, you're going to start clamping the signal down. Um, nonetheless, I would have expected something from Yasu on there to sort of address that situation to prevent ARIA from doing that. But ARIA is finicky and strange and can get into all sorts of all sorts of things. As I, as I bet you're aware if you've been an amateur for any length of time. Okay, so that is the problem. So what I have done, I have ordered replacements. I have uh, received this morning. These are the replacement CP2105s. And shortly I'm going to install it into the, uh, the transceiver. And we will prove that uh, that fixes it. So... To summarise, I believe the problem is caused by Yesu fitting this capacitor. There's two things that we could do to fix the problem. The first thing is in the factory, stop fitting that capacitor because they're obviously not programming in a customised VID PID. The second thing they can do is to create a software application 
which Silicon Labs do have one on their website, to program this chip once. Now they could even program it with the default VID PID. All they need because it only supports programming once. So a little bit of software uh, might be able to prevent this problem occurring in the future. Now this is all supposition and uh, based on experience I guess. I've had a lot of years experience as a technician uh, in a workshop servicing Yaesu transceivers, but not these models. I was servicing the FT817, 818, FT857, FT897, did a few of the FT1000 MPs. That, that sort of era was when I was servicing Yaesu. So today the rigs are a lot more complicated and unfortunately for my eyesight the components are a lot smaller. But anyway, that's all I'm going to talk about on this video. Um, I'll do another short video showing the repair in action. Thank you for watching my video. Cheers! Hi, this is Chris ZL1CVD again. And today I am going to be replacing the CP2105 uh, dual UART chip in this Yaesu FTDX10. Uh, the transceiver I purchased from DX Engineering is under warranty. However, I live in New Zealand and to, trans to get this sent back to Yaesu USA would cost me in excess of uh, probably 150 US dollars or so. So I'm not going to spend that on it. I'm capable of repairing these things. So today I'm going to show you how I'm going to repair it. Uh, this is a this here is the main board of the uh, transceiver, and unfortunately for me, the CP2105 is located on the underside. So as we look at the transceiver here, um, I've removed the top cover remove the top cover and I've removed the uh, screws that hold down the shield and this is the shield which uh, I'm removing now. So there's a bit of work to do we have to disconnect these cables one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven uh, and down here twelve and then we need to undo all these screws and or and this cable here that's 13 uh, we'll undo the screws and we'll lift the board out so the next uh, video I'll show you I'll have done all that and uh, we'll take it from there cheers okay so we have got the uh, the transceiver all in pieces we've managed to uh, unplug all the plugs many of them and this is the board here that we're working on, the main unit. Now, I'd like to point out that the capacitor that causes CP2105 to go into program mode is this little this little one here. It's uh, C2598, um, and we can see it on the circuit diagram here that C2598 is located there. So, I'm going to desolder the I'm going to desolder C2598 and I'm also going to swap out the uh, CP2105 here now to do that I'm going to use hot air now you'll note that there's a lot of uh, tiny components around here and if I hit this all with hot air I'll probably blow some of these off the board which I don't want to do so what we will do is um, I've got some tape here um, some heat resistant tape. I can't remember what the name of it is. Next video I'll look it up and uh, I'll let you know. But what we'll do is we'll tape up the, uh, the, the whole area and just expose the IC that I want to remove. Uh, CP2105. And I'll show you that in the next video. Okay, here we are again. You can see uh, I've taped it all up. Now the tape is called Capton Tape and I'm sure that's just a trademark or, or a, a brand name. Um, there's different types of tapes on the market that you can get for that. It pet tape, pet film tape. Um, it's not terribly expensive, but it's absolutely ideal for situations like this where we uh, only want to heat up the IC uh, and it tracks leading to it and not the components around the other around the rest of the area. So um, I'll get on to the heat gun now and we'll go about swapping the IC out. Okay, so I can officially tell you these things are a nightmare to work on. Um, I managed to change the chip over. 
and I also managed in the process to inadvertently lift a resistor um, so I went and tested it and it didn't work um, I lifted the little resistor oops just the, I don't know whether you can see it just the one that's in there anyway um, which was a bit of a pain but I managed to get it back in and we've, you can see the USB is plugged in I'm powering it up because remember as we said before it's USB powered and good news is uh, CP2105 is now there woohoo so we're all go and I've removed the offending capacitor that uh, that caused the problem so but the truth will be in uh, let's get it all back together a uh, bit of a mess as you can see <laughs> but these things uh, these things uh, happen uh, so just to re re recap I use capped on tape to tape around the uh, so I only heated up supposedly the device I was removing but I still managed to lift the resistor um, I cleaned the board up with good old CRC electric clean which is a very good uh, PCB cleaner and uh, that's the old CP2105 there that is kaput. All right, uh, on to the next stage. Okay, here's a bit of an epilogue. The FTDX10 is put back together again, and it's all working great. Um, we've replaced the uh, CP, the faulty CP2105. The, uh, I've removed the 4.7 microfarad cap that allows it to go into program mode uh, and we've got good communication it's communicating you'll see in a moment when uh, I've got WSJTX working in the background uh, in a moment the as we'll see on the cat display or oh, sorry cat touch it will go into transmit and there we are the cat communication putting out 50 watts a little bit of ALC, a little bit of compression, that's what's normal. No, hardly any SWA, that's a great thing. And we can see we're transmitting there. Um, if I just uh, get rid of that screen and that screen. Yeah, we've got a bit of action going on in FT8, which is great. So this little chip here, CP2105, is used in all the later model ASUS, so it's used in your uh, the 101D and MP, FT991A, FT710, and the little FT891. So it's possible that all those rigs will suffer from it. I am working on the uh, Cat Touch USB here, which is a USB connected version of Cat Touch. And I uh, had a brainwave today that maybe um, I can put a uh, feature in this where, whereby it uh, programs the CP2105 to prevent this from happening in the future. I don't know whether I'm capable of doing that, but we will see. Alright, thank you for watching my video. Have a good one.